uh, event this uh, this evening. I've been told there are some 250, which is great. Now we'll see how many will turn up and uh, not forget the the event. Um, so uh, I will start anyhow introducing our uh, our speaker, and during that time, I hope that um, the, the the room will will have been filled. Uh, I'm very glad to to uh, to welcome uh, uh, Samdeep Sen, uh, who is uh, talking to us from uh, Denmark, from uh, Copenhagen. That's where you are based right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very very nice to have you here, uh, Samdeep, uh, with us. Actually, we tried to do it uh, last year, but we had to postpone it. So it's it's good that uh, that we finally. Uh, have you with us, and uh, that would be to uh, to essentially to speak about uh, your book uh, that I'm holding here to the camera, decolonizing Palestine, Hamas between the anti-colonial and the post-colonial, and uh, as the title indicates, that's uh, uh, a book of reflections about the 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 the, the connection between these two. Uh, uh, relations to to colonialism, the, the, the anti and the post, and how they intertwine, uh, and how uh, actually it's an ongoing struggle. And uh, the 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 case that Sandeep uh, is uh, um, uh, considering to discuss this is that of Hamas in Gaza, and this book is based on fieldwork. Uh, a lot of uh, of uh, visits, trips made to the uh, to the strip, as it's called, the Gaza Strip, and therefore there is an ethno or anthropological uh, research uh, here, uh, work of, of anthropology behind it, which uh, led to 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 this uh, this uh, this book. Uh, uh, some deep, uh, I should, uh, I mean, you've probably read the, the, the announcement, but let me repeat for, uh, if you have uh, forgotten, uh, he is Associate Professor in International Development at uh, uh, Development Studies, that is uh, like uh, my own department here at SOAS, at Roskilde University in Denmark. Um, and uh, uh, well, he is the author of the, the book we mentioned, but also the co-editor of Globalizing Collateral Language from 9-11 to Endless Wars, which is a book that came out uh, uh, more recently that uh, after that book, after uh, the, the Decolonizing Palestine, that was uh, uh, last, uh, last year, actually. And before that, uh, um, uh, Samdeep also co-authored a book uh, called, I mean, titled the, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. So Samdeep has a long familiarity with the, with, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of Palestine and the Palestinian struggle. And um, there, therefore his presence here in uh, the series of, for the Center for, of Palestine Studies at SOAS is uh, very uh, very natural, and actually, you are even an associate member of uh, of uh, of the the Center for Palestine Studies. So, Samdeep, it's absolutely great to to welcome you, and thank you for having uh, uh, given us uh, some of your time for for uh, for this event. Uh, I want also before before giving you the floor to. Uh, to uh, to tell a story that for those who don't know it and uh, to tell it in the form of a very strong protest, it is that you have been uh, deplatformed uh, uh, last year at the University of Glasgow, where you were supposed to give a talk like uh, the one you will be giving us now, and uh, uh, for some misuse of as usual of. Uh, of, of categories such as anti-Semitism and the rest, the university uh, 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 canceled your event, and that was the uh, that led to a big row and a lot of, of protest. And this is uh, absolutely uh, uh, intolerable. This kind of evolution that uh, has been happening over recent years 
uh, using uh, uh, very fake, very false accusations of, uh, of anti-Semitism or suspicions, I should say, of anti-Semitism in order to uh, prevent discussion on issues such as the very actual uh, oppression of the uh, Palestinian people. So without further ado, uh, um, uh, please, uh, Sandeep, I mean, we would be welcoming you with a round of applause had we, were, had, had we not been on Zoom. So we'll listen to you, your presentation uh, for uh, as long as you need, 30, 40 minutes, as you said. And then after that, uh, we will uh, be uh, addressing the questions by the audience in the Q&A uh, 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 device that is linked uh, at the uh, bottom of the screen. So please, Sandeep, welcome uh, on board. Thank you um, so much, um, Gilbert. And um, yeah, thank you for this very kind introduction and the kind invitation. It actually means a lot to be able to uh, present um, this work in um, at SOAS and um, in the presence of Shilbert actually, because I think we met 2014 or 2015, you'd organized a workshop at SOAS and that was my first visit there. And, um, and some of the early work was presented there as well. So it's good to you know come full circle and present this at, at SOAS again. Um, so I'll try to share my um, power. Um, well, a little bit about the um, talk a little bit about the journey, um, the journey of the book, which is essentially, the, uh, you know, my PhD um, started in two thousand eleven. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, where my quest was to really understand the, you know, to, to really unsettle the way we talk about an organization like Hamas. Um, there are certain themes that I want to go through, which is normalizing Gaza, globalizing Hamas, and what I call, what I term uh, in my book as the long moment of liberation. Um, things, these themes would sort of become more clear as we move forward. Um, you know, Gilbert mentioned um, my experience at the University of Glasgow, where I was supposed to, um, where I was supposed to um, deliver this book talk and, you know, questions about academic freedom and, and the norms and what you can talk about with regards to Palestine. You know, it come, comes about when, whenever these sorts of controversies pop up. But this sort of theme of, you know, limits on what, how we can study uh, Palestine was already evident to me back in 2011 when I was starting my PhD, where my, I went into this PhD program in a, in a very, um, let's say, traditional orthodox political science department um, in Denmark, where, where uh, I was interested in Hamas, but also Palestine, but also broader questions of liberation, like what it means to be, you know, what it means to be liberated as fluffy as, you know, uh, an expression like that, like that sounds. So I was interested in the life cycles of liberation struggles. But what I came across, or what I what I what I happened about, were, were the disciplinary norms, and the politics, and the limits on how we were able to, how we are allowed to study Palestine. Um, you know, I was interested in notions of you know post-colonialism, settler colonialism, liberation, anti-colonial arms struggle. You know, I used an expression of <laughs> Fanonian perspective. But you know, very early in the program, as I was trying to do this research, I was told. You know, these were themes or topics that weren't necessarily part of mainstream political science, and therefore I was discouraged from exploring this. I was told that, you know, Gilbert mentioned that I did field work in Gaza, in the West Bank, in, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in, in some of these places. But, you know, I was told very early that, um, you know, I shouldn't do field work. That's not what we're 
meant to do as political scientists, you know, using expression like Fanonian perspective, you know, talking about Fanon, talking about anti-colonial resistance, all of that was seen as too emotional. Essentially, what I was told to do is get rid of the context in which an organization like Hamas operates and be more scientific in my approach. And I like to um, show this picture of the title of you know, the first paper I wrote as part of my PhD, you know, um, the prelude to, I'm sorry, the prelude to civil military complex, right? How using civil military relations, which is something we usually use for the state and see how that applies to an organization like Hamas, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah that has both a, um, uh, a, a civil faction, but a civilian faction, and also a military military um, uh, military um, operation, a military faction. Um, of course, once you arrive in Palestine, you see the power of the context, and and also for you know students or scholars, also shows us the importance of incorporating the context when we talk about what is our theoretical approach, our methodological approach, and what, what we care about empirically. When I arrived in Palestine in 2013, specifically to Gaza, I took a six hour journey from, um, from, uh, from Cairo to the Rafa border between um, Egypt and, and Gaza. When you arrive there, um, this is back in 2013, you see this, you know, an Egyptian tank that is facing incoming traffic. Now, there are soldiers everywhere. There's a, um, you know, your, your, your passport is taken away at this gate and you're basically in sort of this desert landscape without any ID with uh, basically at the mercy of Egyptian authorities to decide whether you can actually enter the passport control um, uh, terminal. Once you're there, you see something like this that would be on the left on the screen. That's the passport department um, where, um, where, where travelers, uh, mostly Palestinians, mostly Gazans, are basically huddled, huddled around the passport control terminal. There are two, um, uh, there are, there, there are two speakers, only one that's operational where someone uh, yells out your name. And once you go there, if you're approved to enter Gaza, a passport is thrown at you. If you're not, and if you're unlucky and they want to do extra checks, they took you to a back room. And um, I wasn't unfortunate enough to go to the back room, but many young Palestinians um, I, I, um, uh, were. Um, one Palestinian doctor um, traveling home said, you know, look here, it's, you know, we're being treated like capital, right? So if, if there was any doubt that you were entering what Fanon called the sector of the colonized, that disappears once you arrive at the Rafa border crossing between Egypt and, between Egypt and Gaza. It is in, in many ways um, uh, personif personifies the sector of the colonized. Yet once you start entering the Palestinian terminal, you know, things change, you know, materially, aesthetically. You have this sign that says, welcome to Palestine. You, you know, you go into a passport, um, a passport uh, control terminal, which at the time was recently built uh, with Qatari funding. And it looked like any passport control terminal that, you know, um, that you would encounter in any uh, international airport. At the passport control terminal, they ask you, why are you here? Uh, how long is your visit? Who are you, you know, where are you staying? Who, who has invited you? Um, uh, as, a, as a brown man traveling in, you know, in the West, these are questions that I am very familiar with and, and things that I, that I asked, you know, asked of me. So it's interesting because you know, while aesthetically, again, you know, uh, and the experience of the Egyptian terminal very much confirmed the fact that you were entering the sector of the colonized. And, and I have no doubt that, you know, Gaza is still, on, you know, uh, under siege and occupied and, 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 and colonized. Yet, aesthetically, when you enter the Palestinian terminal, it looks very much like you were entering 
the, the era of the post-colonial state, right? As a normal liberated state. And I know this is aesthetic and it's not real, but nonetheless, this is sort of this, this between the anti-colonial and the post-colonial is something that I kept going back and forth, right? And that was, that sort of defined my experience of Gaza in general. You, uh, in the book, I write about entering a, 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 a bazaar in, 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 in Gaza City that reminded me very much of the, you know, open bazaars that I grew up in uh, around um, in India. Yet, you also saw pictures of martyrs and destroyed buildings that were, uh, buildings that were destroyed during uh, ritual military onslaughts on Israeli military onslaughts on Gaza. Once I entered Gaza, I had to extend my residence permit, and I had to get this residence permit from from a specific authority, Palestinian Authority um, uh, division, and um, we knew that entry into Gaza and exit out of Gaza was very much depended on Israeli authorities and Egyptian authorities, and Palestinians not have sovereignty in that matter. Yet, we went through that ritual. Even meeting Hamas officials, um, I was under the impression I'm meeting these revolutionaries. Um, I didn't really think about you know, what I was wearing. Yet, one of my gatekeepers said, well, you can't go in dressed like that. You need to have a suit. Um, so I ended up going suit shopping in Gaza to show up to meet Hamas officials who equally were dressed up as representatives of the state. Yet when in our conversations, of course, they were using the language of an anti-colonial struggle, the language of liberation. And this was interesting because at that time, you know, 2013, um, you know, 13, 14, 15, um, the puzzle was very much about what Hamas is going to do, choosing between its military operations, its Mopauma, or becoming a largely governing entity. And international observers were convinced that Hamas has to do one or the other. Um, yet, in my time in Gaza, Palestinians in general, Gazans in general, and Hamas in particular, seem to be more at ease, not completely at ease, but more at ease with these two roles. So performing like a state that doesn't exist, yet still engaging in an anti-colonial struggle, an anti-colonial arms struggle. So I shifted the puzzle from, you know, how and to what extent Hamas is able to balance these two roles, these two roles of the military and the civil, and started looking more at what does it mean for the post-colonial and the anti-colonial to live within the context of a liberation, liberate, uh, a liberation struggle. So something that looks like you know, the era of colonial rule and something that looks like the era after the flight of the colonizer. How are they able to live alongside each other? What does it that mean? for the trajectory of decolonization? And what does it mean for, you know, how we define what it means to be liberated or unliberated, right? So as I explored this question in the book, I of course um, begin by, um, you know, contextualizing the settler, colonial, settler colonialism as the, uh, uh, you know, settler colonialism as, as the broader context in which um, this brand of politics is happening. Uh, in doing so, you know, you know, I begin with the sort of the basic premise of what settler colonial is and does. And what I argue is that it's driven by this dream of indigenous non-existence, right? Uh, this idea that the settler is settling on, um, on virgin land, right? So, then I go into this discussion about um, Israel and the insistent elimination of Palestine, Palestinians, and Palestinianness. This elimination of any material evidence of Palestinian existence that would, of course, um, contradict this idea of virgin territory happens in many ways, right? And, and folks that are here 
obviously are very uh, uh, knowledgeable about this, right? So culture, you know, appropriation of cultural artifacts, food. Um, um, I, you know, in the book, I even talk about Conan O'Brien being confronted by the, the American talk show, being confronted by um, a Palestinian activists in Bethlehem because he, um, he uh, called, um, I forget which Palestinian dish, but a Palestinian dish, um, Israeli. And you could clearly see Conan O'Brien in this sort of interaction. I, I think the whole thing is online, so if you want to see, you can, you can check it out. Um, Conan O'Brien is clearly um, flabbergasted that among all the things that are happening in Palestine, why would Palestine, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian activists or Palestine solidarity activists care about food. But of course, Palestinians know because that's another evidence of Palestinian existence that is being wiped away. I also do field work in, um, in, in Jerusalem where I look at uh, Israeli museums, Israeli museums celebrating what Israelis call the War of Independence. And I look at the ways in which Palestinians are mentioned or not mentioned, right? Uh, in most cases, of course, there is no mention of the word Palestine or Palestinians. But in a place like the Palmach Museum, Palestinians are referred in two, in sort of in two occasions. One, when they're referred to as um, marauding Arab gangs. And in the other uh, instance, which was sort of a, 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 a sort of a movie, uh, a, a recreation of a, a historical event or a conversation where one character asks another, so what do we do with these refugees without mentioning who they are? And the other one says, well, do what you want, you know, do what you think is best. So of course, the existence of Palestinians as Palestinians is not you know, there in these museums. But in the book, I also talk about the biological elimination of Palestinians and Palestinians where we talk about, where I talk about the past, of course, the Nakba, which was sort of the uh, physical elimination of Palestine and Palestinian communities and Palestinians. But I also talk about more recent biological elimination of Palestine. Um, you see this uh, in the end of 2015, when I was in, um, I was in Jerusalem, where Awad sisters, uh, cousins, who, um, um, engaged in one of these knife attacks uh, uh, next to Mahdi Yehuda, um, the western part of uh, Jerusalem. And if you see the CCTV um, uh, camera footage, you'll see that um, at that time, a lot of um, citizens were very much armed. It was during what was called the knife in the father and the mayor of Jerusalem had encouraged uh, Jerusalem lights to carry uh, weapons. And um, you can see that while even though they have fallen on the ground, they're continuously shot at, right? Almost as a way of uh, eliminating any rebellious, uh, you know, any uh, rebellious evidence of Palestinian existence that that um, that these two young, you know, these two teenagers embody. You also saw this um, the book I talk about uh, the lynching of uh, Haf Hafkan uh, Zadhu, who was an Eritrean um, asylum seeker who was at a bus stop in Beersheba, the bus terminal, and there was um, uh, you know a rumor going around about a Palestinian. Uh, attacker being on the on the loose, and first uh, Hassan was 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 shot at, and then he was kept in his place um, um, with a chair and on top of him while bystanders took turns kicking him and beating him. Uh, and this is all caught on camera. Again, again, this was the any sort of in indication or any sort of uh, suspicion of any evidence of rebellious Palestinian that was being insistently eliminated in that point. Um, I'm sorry if it's a bit grim, but you know, it is a grim affair that we're talking about. So with this context of elimination, of settler colonial elimination in place, I moved on to theorize and discuss, um, uh, discuss um, uh, Hamas's armed struggle as well as its 
sort of the rituals of statecraft. With regards to Hamas's armed struggle, I brought in a, a, a you know a detailed a, a Fanonian perspective that looked at violence's ability to unmake, that is destroy and also make. Uh, and in anti-colonial struggles, violence is often described as this destructive force that is able to unmake the the colonial uh, the materiality of colonial rule. Right. Of course. I recognize in the book that, you know, the material resources available to um, Palestinians are overshadowed by the military might of the state of Israel. So, of course, militarily, an organization like Hamas cannot unmake the, uh, the, um, the Israeli settler colonial rule. But looking at a case like... Um, the uh, Hamas attack on the whole. Uh, I talk about the its minimal ability to unmake, which is that it you know of course it may not be able to wholesale un unmake the settler colonial rule, but it minimally demonstrates or evokes the persistence of the Palestinian struggle, and makes the colonial endeavor a difficult one to maintain. With this sort of unmaking ability, I ask, can violence also be something that makes, that can be a creative force? And this may be difficult to talk about seeing as in any military engagement with, with Israel, often it's Palestinians that suffered the most material and human um, um, loss. But in my, through my interviews, what I show that even through the hurt, the pain, the injury, the death, Palestinian, my Palestinian interlocutors were able to write the signature of Palestine or reiterate Palestinian existence through those experiences. So whether it was a bodily injury or a, a trauma of the past, you know, my interlocutors would say that, you know, this, this bruise reminds me that Palestine exists, reminds me that I am still Palestinian, right? Or if we look at sort of, you know, Palestinian martyrs and the way, um, you know, and if you look at, say, the scene of a, of a funeral procession, you know, when an individual dies, it's the death of the individual, but in that procession, their body is wrapped with the, yeah, the body is wrapped with the Palestinian flag, where the, the, that, that, that suffering transcends from being an individual suffering to being a collective suffering. And of course, in that collective, you know, uh, Fanon talks about this chain, this chain that connects the colonized people together. You know, in that, that suffering, that uh, mourning of that suffering, you know, Palestinians as a, commun as, as a national people come together. Then, of course, there is the, um, the strange aspect of, of post-colonial statecraft that an organization like Hamas engages in. I'm not going to say state, but all the rituals and bureaucracies are there to keep up this you know, performance of, of stateness, right? Of course, there is, we have to contextualize this, right? And in the book, I contextualize this through the Oslo Accords. And the arrival of the Oslo Accords that brought post-coloniality into Palestine. Officially, Os the um, Oslo Accords established the Palestinian Authority, this sort of self-governing entity that was meant to be the precursor of the Palestinian state, right? Or the future post-colonial Palestinian state. Of course, we know that it was never meant to achieve that, right? What it did was, or what it ended by introducing post-coloniality, by introducing these rituals and institutions and bureaucracies, what it wanted to do is change the subjective identity of the Palestinian, uh, the colonized Palestinian, where the idea was to keep Palestinian revolutionary factions 
busy with engaging in these rituals of statecraft, wearing the suit, you know, being you know, a bureaucrat, and doing that in less time fighting Israel. So change the subject capacity of the palace of, of, of the liberation faction, but in doing so also undermine the Palestinian cause. And we did that by incentivizing these rituals, providing resources, recognizing you as the you know, legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. You have, if you engage in these, if you agree to engage in statecraft and less fighting, then you get access to the state. Of course, you also get access to the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the instruments of public violence, yeah? which is very valuable because then that allows you to uh, suppress your opposition. Of course, this also, there's also disincentives built in, right? If you engage in the anti-colonial struggle, what you're gonna feel is the violence of this state-like entity, right? And we saw that last summer, right? Where the Palestinian, the, the kind of violence the Palestinian authority was using against, um, against uh, Palestinian activists in the, in the West Bank. So then returning to Hamas, you know, how does this post-colonial governance live in a settler colonial condition, especially in how does Hamas deal with it? And of course, you know, this puzzle, so to speak, began in 2006 with the Palestinian Legislative Council elections where, you know, contrary to the expectations of international observers, Hamas won. And the idea was what would Hamas choose to do? And instead of choosing either governance or you know, sticking to its role as an as a armed faction, it chose to do both, right? And so how does it chose to do both? Both act like an armed anti-colonial faction, yet also engage in these rituals of statecraft. And, um, you see these rituals of statecraft in many ways, and I mentioned them. Another classic one where the rituals, of, you know, you, this, this sign that you see, no guns allowed, was evident in, it, it was present in all, you know, uh, you know buildings in, in the Gaza Strip. And, you know, in the book, I sort of relate this to sort of classical state building processes, right? And, you know, from a Tillian perspective, what did the state do? You know, it, it, you know, it took away guns from everyone. That's exactly what Hamas did. It took away guns from everyone so that it had monopoly over violence. Um, so the question, okay, once again, state-like conduct, liberation context, how does this live together? And I, and I, and I bring in the spec two perspectives, right? Of course, the perspective of Hamas, which when asked, why do you engage in these rituals? of statecraft representing a state that doesn't exist. And for them, they said, well, what we're trying to do is bring in the anti-colonial perspective within an institution that is a colonial construct. Um, and we are here while the previous governing entity, specifically talking about Qatar, it's, it's, its rival, while the previous governing entity work to undermine the liberation struggle, we are here to protect. Um, and that often meant that, you know, Hamas sought to have leadership over all liberation activities, all protest activities, right? Which is why the Great March of Return was a, was a, was a real challenge to Hamas's sort of authority in Gaza. Of course, this narrative that Hamas is saying of introducing, um, you know, the anti-colonial perspective in a colonial construct is something you hear about from liberation struggles across the world. The SLN, you know, introduce, claim to introduce the, uh, you know, the anti-colonial perspective in the colonial state. If you look at most post-colonial states, they use you know, uh, institutions and laws and uh, means of, uh, say, public violence, right? So uh, the baton charge that you see in the UK 
you know, was adopted in the Indian police practice, and we just call it a lati charge, right? Um, of course, there's the other perspective. How do colonized uh, Gazans, Gazans living under siege, experience this ritual of statecraft? And of course, oftentimes, as I write in the book, it's through violence. It's through uh, brutal oppression of, of, of Hamas authorities. Hamas police force who um, try to suppress any sort of, um, you know, criticism or critique of their of their of their rule of the Gaza Strip, and uh, which of course once again is not uncommon for liberation factions to oppress other liberation factions, um, but through the hurt and the violence, and often the, in a tragic sense. Palestinians also talked about the tragedy of Palestinian governments, right? And while the, you know, while they were hurt and they were uh, depressed by this form form of governance, they once again called it a Palestinian form of governance, right? Um, you know, um, and in, in a tragic sense, introducing the signature of Palestine here again. This while the colonizer says that. Palestine does not exist. So then the question is, so what? I've shown this brand of post-colonial governance and I introduce, you know, and I show the, the, the similarities between the conduct of Hamas, you know, of the Hamas government, if you want to call it that, and that of post-colonial states. We see that, you know, we saw the relevance, this existence of post-colonial governance and a settler colonial condition. And of course, you have the anti-colonial struggle as well. So, so what, how, what does it mean to have the anti-colonial and the post-colonial living within a liberation context? And I sort of stepped back and I showed that in the book that this sort of ritual of post-coloniality during the era of the anti-colonial struggle is not uncommon. Um, a lot of the book, you know, relates to the Indian independence struggle being from India, uh, you know, that's some of the historical background that I, that I was attracted to. And I showed that, um, you know, and I bring up this instance of a, of a dorm room uh, at a university, at a college, a dorm room being used as sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know as a, as a, as a state-like entity, as a as deliberated state where, where um, uh, you know, activists engaged in, you know, state-like behavior, both as a way, you know, you know, also, you know, uh, you know, as part of the liberation struggle, but also as a way of keeping the national community together and through those rituals, keeping up the sense of the national being. This was happening during the anti-colonial struggle. I also show that, you know, in liberated states, in post-colonial states doesn't mean that people don't talk about liberation, whether we're talking about in Southern Africa, where remnants of, you know, in terms of land ownership continued, colonial land ownership continued in the era of the post-colonial state, so to speak, or, you know, misuse of the anti-colonial struggle in, in, in a place like India. Um, which is being used to, this narrative is being used to, um, to oppress and suppress um, uh, religious minority communities. Um, it's very common to see the anti-colonial also continue on in the era of the post-colonial state. So what does it mean that the anti-colonial and the post-colonial to be on both sides of this moment of liberation, right? Uh, this, 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 this moment where we usually celebrate as Independence Day. It's supposed to divide the anti and the post, right? The colonial and the post-colonial. Um, so what does it mean that the anti-colonial and post-colonial appear on both sides of this moment? And I conclude then that liberation then is not about this moment. Liberation is this long um, process that begins long before um, the flight of the colonizer, but continues long after. Um, it is often uh, contradictory, if often uh, takes a circuitous path, but uh, liberation is often a perpetual process. 
And that has less to do with you know, the colonized people or colonized, formerly colonized people's uh, inability to settle on who they are. Uh, it has more to do with the treachery of colonial rule that works to, especially in a settler colonial context, works to um, entirely erase the colonized people's sense of self. And you continue to struggle long after the flight of the colonizer because of that exact fact, because th there has been a historical process of what it means, of, 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 of erasure, of any memory of what it means to be indigenous, right? Of, of to be uh, a people not affected by the, by the processes of, of colonization. Oops, I'm trying to. So in, in arguing these things, what am I trying to achieve in the book? One of the things that I wanted, wanted to do with the book is normalize Gaza. Now, Gaza in the narrative of, you know, with, with, uh, with the closure of Gaza, with the siege of Gaza, we are, um, um, research has become very difficult. And Gaza is often treated as this exceptional place an exceptionally contemptible place, right? Where people can have a normal conversation about Palestine, even, you know, self people who would self-describe themselves as liberals in Israel would recognize, um, and, you know, what the, 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 the tragedy and the treachery of what's happening in Jerusalem, what's happening with the settling, settlement movement in the, uh, in the West Bank, yet, when, you know, when it comes to Gaza, they would say, but Hamas, right? Donna Neville has this fantastic article in Tikkun called, but Hamas, where it's placed outside any normal discussions of what's happening in Palestine. But through the book, I want to normalize that, right? I want to normalize Gaza. That's why I started by connecting Hamas, Gaza with the settler colonial context. Because if you look at the history of Gaza, it actually is a microcosm of the entirety of the Palestinian experience. Because very quickly after the Nakba, it was democratic, demographically transformed, where Gaza became a place where the majority of the population were refugees, who um, carried with them the memory and identity of, of a people having suffered this process of elimination, right? If you look at, say, the classical works of people like Sarah Roy, who have then showed that, you know, um, uh, Gaza effect, you know, was not just affected demographically, but also socioeconomically. And so it's not surprising that Gaza is a place where you have, you know, where, where um, iconic Palestinian re revolutionary figures have been trained. Um, Gaza is a place where, you know, intifada stopped. Yeah, Gaza in some way historically has been a microcosm of these processes, right? The treatment of Gaza by Israel is also treated as, you know, people who would be supportive of the Palestinian cause have been treated as exceptional. But I would argue that it's actually normal because Gaza being this place where, you know, um, revolution starts, where popular uprising starts, is the loudest critique of this idea of terra nullius, of this idea of you know, Israel being built on a land without a people. Yeah? And by and through these revolutionary actions, or through, through the violence, through, 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 this, through the starting of, uh, of, of Intifada, um, they sort of are the loudest critique of that, which is why it's not surprising that the settler colonizer feels so much contempt for Gaza and Gaza. In the book, I also wanted to globalize Hamas, where you know I've, I noticed that this idea of global Palestine, um, you know, my my bachelor supervisor John Collins wrote this book called Global Palestine, and we've seen this you know you know wonderful shift of moving away of from the exceptionalism of the study of Palestine and Israel, um, and 
and and placing Palestine alongside global struggles against ethnic colonialism, anti-colonial struggles, and so forth. Um, obviously, because of the way both in public discourse, but in scholarly discourse, we talk about Hamas and Gaza, that hasn't happened. And what I wanted to do through my work is to ask these sort of broad questions about liberation, what it means to be unliberated, but then also, but in doing that, place Palestine and Hamas and Gaza alongside the pantheon of anti-colonial struggles and post-colonial struggles and post-colonial you know, uh, politics that exists a lot across the world. So you'll see that in this book, I, it's almost schizophrenic because I get into this very, um, you know, anthropological, as, as Gilbert mentioned, descriptions of my experiences and encounters in Palestine, but very quickly, I then jump to India, or Tanzania, or Kenya, or Kashmir, or Mexico. And interestingly, the book starts in the border between Gaza and Egypt, but ends in Tanzania, where I was finishing up the book while, um, following my wife who was doing field work there, but had certain reflections and encounters and, you know, um, uh, self-indulgent self -indulgent thoughts about, you know, what it means to be liberated. Am I liberated? You know, how can we liberate it? Can we ever be liberated? So, um, and of course, you know, I end up talking about, um, you know, this long moment of liberation and, you know, the conclusion, of course, is that liberation is not contingent on the withdrawal of the colonizer, as the struggle for uh, liberation continues long after the flight of the colonizer. By doing that, I think I wanted to also push us to be um, a bit more sympathetic in terms of how we talk about liberation struggles. I think oftentimes we become very economical. Right? We say, did this action lead to liberation? No, it didn't, so it was a worthless action. But if we look at the history of liberation struggles in general, we'll see that it's a, it's a winding path and it's often contradictory. And we should, we should remember that when we talk about the Palestinian struggle for liberation. And here is a picture you know, of, uh, of Israeli products in, 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 in Gaza supermarket. And, you know, I, I leave that here because it does something to you where, you know, you're in this lifelong struggle against the colonizer, yet you're compelled to use, you know, the colonizer's currency, their products, their, you know, even their meat products, right? And it does something to, to you and to you as a people, as a colonized people. And we should remember that when we talk about, you know, what is liberation? How can we liber liberate ourselves? And, um, you know, what is the trajectory of a, of a liberation struggle? So, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Very interesting talk and uh, a lot of food of, for thought, uh, although I should say I'm not seeing any questions yet in the Q&A. So let me then have a chat with you then until, uh, okay, people are, are starting, but let me uh, uh, make some comments and uh, bring you to, to carry on in your uh, explanation. Um, uh, what I would like you to to maybe address is the the very meaning of liberation because uh, even if you take the Palestinian context you had the formula in Arabic which was the center of debates liberating land and human being and you had big discussions about that of course the right wing would say human being is to be postponed after the liberation of land. Mm. And uh, if this human being is a woman, it's, it would be even more postponed, you know, until a uh, uh, very vague future. And therefore, uh, when, uh, I mean, in the way you speak of liberation, one gets the impression that you are only meaning liberation in the sense of the territorial land liberation. And uh, because if you take it in the other, in the fuller concept, then 
there might be a contradiction between the post-colonial state and liberation. The post-colonial state may, and that's actually most of the cases have been of, uh, of oppressive post-colonial states. That is uh, countries that have been liberated from the colonizer, but not uh, from uh, all sorts of oppression, right? And so, and this brings me to a second dimension of the same comment, which is I, I, I practically, I think you haven't used the term Islam a single time during your whole uh, presentation. Now, this is, uh, when you speak about Hamas, this is a, a feat. Uh, it's, it's it, I understand that, it, there, it is certainly deliberate in the sense that you don't want to, I mean, there is too much, uh, um, too much insistence on, on that uh, dimension of Hamas. And uh, like in the Bat, Bat Hamas that you, you mentioned and all that, that this uh, religious uh, dimension would be put forward uh, usually. But uh, uh, can we just uh, uh, ignore it? I mean, is it, isn't it part of also this post-colonial state, the specific post-colonial state, uh, uh, adding a layer of oppression, if you want, uh, that is uh, specific to, to the uses of, of religion by a post-colonial state uh, uh, in that regard, whether about women or, or, or more generally. Hmm. So, yeah. If you could please, and then I see there are a few questions, four questions, so we'll take them after you. You, you, you. Uh, you. Yeah, I think um, you're you're absolutely right with regards to this question of liberation. I think that, um, well, in the book, you know, I do talk a lot about sort of the material aspects of liberation, but you know, especially when I engage in the discussions of, you know. Um, the creative aspects of violence, right? That's where I really engage in this discussion of, you know, you know, um, liberating the self, right? And I engage specifically in questions about, um, you know, uh, you know, what does it mean to be liberated? You know, the Fanonian perspective on, you know, attractions to whiteness, the you know, um, the black skin, the white mass sort of arguments. I talk about Palestinians who find themselves, um, you know, who talk about their relationship with Israelis, and how they felt good about that yet, you know, uh, rejected. I talk about um, Palestinians struggling to, um, uh, 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 um, to um, Palestinians talking about and struggling with the idea that when they have to think about what a liberated state would look like, oftentimes what's closest to them is Israel. And they find that it's, it's you know, uh, you know, the Palestinian planned city, Rawabi, is a good example, which many Palestinians call that as a, as a Palestinian settlement. And the design and aesthetics of it very much, you know, even though it's Live, you know, it's it. Um, you know, the, the you know, as um, you know, a, as the design of the place is, and I've visited the place where they use a lot of the aesthetics of you know the national aesthetic, the big flag and the Palestinian this and Palestinian that. But we know that the the the, the builders, the architects, took inspirations from from um, from uh, uh, um, from Israeli settlements. So there is this struggle and there's a struggle with regards to Israeli products. You know, we, we had long conversations that I put in the book of Palestinian struggle, Gazan, my Gazan friends struggling with this idea of, you know, uh, Gazans thinking that Israeli products are better, even though, you know, Egyptian products are, you know, more available and there's a class issue and all of that. There's another aspect of liberation that I also want to mention, which sort of, I sort of missed out in engaging it more also because of the timing of when I wrote the book is to what extent ideas of liberation are connected to something like the state, right? And as you mentioned, you know, uh, there's a reason why the, you know, Hamas is acting the way it does in regards to its governing role because a lot of post-colonial states are incredibly violent. And as, you know, even Fanon talks about the, 
national bourgeoisie basically replacing the colonizer and using the, the colonizer's tools. So, so I think that that's a conversation, you know, in the book I end by, you know, uh, much more, you know, philosophical discussions about violence in the state. And, you know, people talk about, you know, the state has a monopoly over violence, right? And how, you know, state building and war making are synonymous processes or related processes. And, you know, when Charles Tilly talked about that, you know, political scientists, sociologists ran with it and then started talking and the obvious conclusion or next step was, um, um, okay, how organized and how systematic does this violence need to be for it to contribute to state building? rather than questioning why should violence be, um, you know, the language of statecraft, right? Even, you know, I'm not a political theorist and I, you know, I'm not as well read as a lot of these uh, political scientists and political theorists, but even Tilly describes the state as a mafia, right? So um, I think that that's a, that's a, so I engage in that conversation, but I also, I missed the point with regards to in the book, with regards to liberation being, connected to the state and the problems with that, right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of very fruitful discussions happening in Palestine that we've seen, especially with regards to the activism we saw last year, uh, the activism against the Palestinian Authority, where Palestinians are actually showing us, and a lot of these uh, post-colonial, you know, so-called liberated states showing us that it is not enough to secure the state to ensure your liberation. I think liberation is a bigger process, uh, or has to be a bigger process because of how treacherous and intrusive colonialism is. With <laughs> regards to religion, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm not saying that we can completely ignore that. And, and you're right, it was a, it was a. It was basically a decision I made that I'm not going to talk about religion, and I sort of moved on. Yeah. But, but um, it's also to recognize how limiting conversation on Islam and Islamism can really be, right? Of course, the urge is to often, you know, Hamas and is Islamist, so we. Um, uh, 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 relate all their actions to their religious orientation, which I don't think is unimportant, the religious aspect. But it's also important through my book to recognize that I want to do is to recognize that, well, um, Hamas's conduct in many ways is not different from, you know, other um, factions like Hamas or even in Palestine, you know. Are we forgetting that the Palestinian Authority is has been, or, or you know, led by Fatah, has been an incredibly oppressive force as well. So I wanted to, you know, indicate that, and and that meant making a political decision, or a, you know, a, a, you know, decision at the very beginning of the book to say that I know religion is important, but I am looking beyond that. But I also wanted to recognize the books that you know how porous these. Um, you know, religious affiliations can really be. I mean, I have interviewees who have been members, you know, through their lifetime, have been members of PFLP, uh, of Fatah, of Islamic Jihad, and of, of, of Hamas, and before they said, you know, to hell with everything, right? So um, while you have the organization, and the book is also, you know, it's about the organization, of course, Hamas is on the title, and it's about, but it's about Palestine and Palestinian people and how they navigate these different realities of, 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 of uh, the sector of the colonized. So I wanted to allow myself to engage in those sorts of, um, you, know, uh, you know, discussions as well. But okay, very clear. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll be taking a few questions at a time. So uh, either you take notes or you, you keep them in memory, but uh, so, so we take them round after round. Uh, I start with, uh, so we have uh, Anne Nairfan with uh, thanking you for uh, this interesting talk and asking, could you, could you talk a little about how you are conceptualizing postcoloniality here 
as the term can be used to denote either partial sovereignty or full liberation from colonialism? And how do you see continuities with coloniality in the case of Hamas? Continuities with coloniality in the case of Hamas. And uh, Anne is also asking uh, about the reference for but Hamas, if you could uh, repeat that uh, so that uh, people know where to find this, uh, this article that you mentioned. Then we have Saadi Nawaz, who is <clears throat> asking, uh, do you feel nation branding within the context of Palestine is a worthwhile discussion? And she also uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, your, your talk, which she thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and then we have Rodnit Lentin. Hello, Rodnit. Um, who is uh, asking about uh, decolonization. Fanon speaks of decolonization as disorder. Can you relate this idea to your argument about the question of liberation as an unending process? So let's start with these questions, please. And then we move to the other questions. Uh, yeah, after the first question about Conceptualize post coloniality and thanks for that. Uh, there's a problem with the, the sound. Oh. 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 Or. Yeah, there are kind of parasites or. No, no, now we are, we're not uh, hearing you. Are you hearing me? Okay, say something. No, yeah, you, you cut the sound completely. Uh, are you muted? No, you're not. No, the problem we are not hearing some deep, uh, Aki. Thank you. Your, your mic needs adjusting, says uh, Aki. Is this better? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay, now we All hear right. you. Um, hello? Yes. Hello. Okay, I can't hear you though. Ah. Um, shoot. Okay. Select microphone. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you, we can oh. hear you. Okay, perfect, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so with regards to um, the post-colonial and the post-coloniality, I, of course, I see it as sort of this two-part conception. So of course, there is the timed argument with regards to the era after post-colonial rule. But within that, I do look at it as this, as this idea of, uh, and what you say, as this sort of partial sovereignty, where you find yourself um, living, you know, in an era after the official rule of colonial, uh, official end of colonial rule, and you feel this urge to, you know develop the sense of indigeneity or proclaim the sense of indigeneity, yet, you know, your present is very much embossed with the emblem of the era of colonization, right? So um, someone talks about, you know, uh, post-coloniality as this sort of era of confusion and it is post-colonial is very much about this continuity and that flows into this, the case of Hamas, right? This, this colonial continuity, because um, yes, you have the material remnants of colonial rule, but as I mentioned, you know, um, before, you know, colonialism as a process works to erase any memory of indigeneity. Um, I, the book I talk about, you know, history not being, um, you know, open to um, course correction. Specifically, I engage with this discussion about removing English 
as a national language or one of the national languages, official languages in India. And history doesn't work like course correction. You can't simply sidestep you know, this era of colonization and find this indigenous, you know, this, this, this era of indigeneity where you weren't you know, uh, affected by all these, um, you know, of, by colonialism. So that's why I talk about liberation being in the era of the post-colonial state, being this continuous process because you're continuously trying to come up with this idea of indigeneity when um, when, um, because, and, and the, uh, when the memory of this era of indigeneity completely escapes you. Um, with regards to your second question, I think I've already answered um, uh, the But Hamas article is by Donna Neville. And I think it came out in uh, yeah, I, um, 2008 in, the, in Tikkun magazine. It's a progressive publication. Um, T-I-W-K-U-N. Yes, T-I-W-K-U-N, exactly. Um, with regards to idea of nation brand, um, that's a very um, interesting question, um, Sadia. Um, um, uh, Ravind the Kaur, who's a colleague here in Denmark who wrote about um, nation branding in India um, uh, and how this branding the nation has been um, has been the um, has been a cover for. Um, uh, authoritarian and neoliberal practices in India under, under Modi. Um, in the same way, I felt the problematic of nation branding, and I don't talk about that in the book, but very much present in, uh, in, in these sorts of um, uh, endeavors like Rawabi, which is the first Palestinian planned city, where it was all about you know, creating the Palestinian national brand without really engaging with um, the question of liberation. I don't know if that makes any sense where, you know, liberation in, 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 you know, entails um, uh, attacking and, and, and upending and, and, and um, reversing several you know, political, economic, social, cultural processes, processes that work to disconnect um, a national people from their sense of self. Yet, you know, branding, you know, Rawabi as a Palestinian project that, you know, only a certain class of Palestinians are allowed to enter, by the way, um, you know, disconnects um, the struggle from those processes and, and assumes that these superficial things like a big flag, the biggest Palestinian flag in Palestine or a statue by a Palestinian artist or um, you know, being on a mountain you know, facing or being higher than an Israeli settlement is all that liberation is about and it, liberation is much more substantial. And engaging in those, um, you know, things, um, these sort of branding processes, forget some some of the most substantial aspects of what decolonization is all about. Uh, with regards to um, disorder, um, um, Ronan, thank you so much for that question, and it's nice to electronically um, meet you. Um, I think that um, that idea of disorder very much plays into my discussion of Hamas's um, um, sort of arm struggle as a process of unmaking, where I, I, where I argue that, of course, you know, materially, it's not able to unmake the, the, uh, the settler colonial project as a whole, but it is there to um, instill this idea of disorder into the settler colonial project not allowing it to settle, so to be, you know? And, I, and it was very much evident in this uh, operation that uh, Hamas did in, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the dates, but in Nahal Oz, which is a, um, a, 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 a Israeli um, um, 
kibbutz and not too far away, an outpost not too far away from Gaza, where you know a Palestinian, um, you know, a, 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 a Hamas um, uh, operatives sort of went, you know, dug a tunnel, went in, attacked, and you know they they filmed the whole thing and they went back. Of course. Hamas celebrated this as a Palestinian victory. It's not like it, it, it completely destroyed Nahal Oz. It was a couple of casualties, may, you know, maybe only injuries. But what it did was it made Nahal Oz uh, residents feel unsafe. It told them that this wasn't a place of order, of calm, of, of peace, so to speak. And you see that in the way you know, in the interviews with uh, with 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 um, with residents of 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 the community there, who talk about you know feeling unsafe and feeling that you know you're not safe here and the family's not safe here and so on and so forth. So I think that that's where these ideas of of disorder really comes in in terms of unsettling you know the orderedness, the systems that are in place that keep the uh, settler col colonial project go. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, just a note in passing, I'm not sure that uh, the Palestinian Authority can be uh, classified under the category of post-colonial. I would rather classify it under neo-colonial. Mm. That's a different discussion. Uh, let's uh, carry on with the, the uh, other questions. We have uh, some 15 minutes. So we have Ibrahim Notel who is asking about uh, the process of transformation that Hamas has been going through while functioning between governance and resistance. It's something that you have more or less already um, addressed. There is uh, Alison Dingle who is asking about, uh, who's saying if, about the food example that you gave, if Israelis Israelize Palestinian food, what does this suggest about the long-term future of Israeli identity? Then we have two questions by Ismail Sayed. Um, and uh, the, the, he says, uh, well, thanking you like the others, Question one, the Zionist claim Palestine and Palestinian nation is a recent colonial concept and historically didn't exist from before, not even in the Ottoman era. So the current Palestinians were historically seen as claimed by Eurocentric Zionists as part of the wider Arabs, okay. So um, where's the question here? Uh, in fact, if any uh, more than... Uh, which takes me to question two. I haven't uh, seen the question in question one. So let's see question two. Palestinians during planned UN partition were given much larger chunk as claimed by Zionists. Um, pop, pop, pop. So Transjordan was given away to Arabs, which included Palestinian Arabs who got their major part of the generous partition. So the Palestinian Jews, sick, uh, as I see, got a smaller part of the UN partition, hence then Israeli Jews was generous. What would you say? I don't know if you got exactly what the, the question is about. Uh, but anyhow, it's about the, the uh, Zionist uh, argument and uh, how do you reply to this? Then we have uh, uh, Jenna Alokar who's asking how do you best talk about Islam when discussing decolonial, decolonializing beyond looking beyond it? Uh, because you mentioned, you said looking beyond it. So how do you best talk about it? Uh, okay. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and there's a last uh, question here. And I think we'll, we'll uh, end with this question uh, because uh, you have just uh, enough time to answer these questions. It's about the state building process of Palestine. Will it be uh, completed if occupation has ended despite the uh, fragmentation of the Palestinians, despite the existence of so many factions among the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. So these are the questions and floor is to you to answer them and wrap up if you, if you, if you wish. Um, yeah, so um, with regards to the question of um, governance and uh, governance and resistance, um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the book 
you know, in its entirety is about this sort of long process, right? So obviously I'm not saying that Hamas is the same organization that, um, um, that it was in, you know, 1988 or 1992 or 2006. I mean, obviously the pressures of the siege and the processes and, and, and the events that have taken place since 2006 have pushed Hamas to be a more reactive armed struggle than it is, than it has been in the future. And you see these sorts of processes taking place with liberation factions across the world. But I think that you know, what is unique about Hamas is that it's not unique that it has both these wings, right? And it's not unique for these, the anti and the post and the governance and the, and the violence, the governance and the resistance being part of a liberation struggle. And that's what I wanted to, you know, argue through the book. What is unique, of course, what's, what Hamas helps us with doing is that at this point, it is an organization that officially has agreed to do both, right? Officially has said that we're both governing and resisting. That allows us to recognize and normalize this nature of the liberation struggles where you, know, you have this governance and resistance happening at the same time. With regards to, um, you know, on your food example, if Israelis, Israelis, Palestinian food, what does this suggest about long-term future about Israeli identity. I mean, whew, uh, I mean, it serves Israeli identity quite well, right? I mean, it works really well to indigenize the settler community. And I'll, I'll give another example. Let's go move away from food, but look at architecture, right? Look at Hebrew University and the history of Hebrew University. And you know, my next book is all about space and planning and design and architecture in, in, uh, in of, of, of Israeli spaces, so to speak. And a lot of effort was put into, um, if you look at the old campus of Hebrew University, if anyone's been there, a lot of effort was put into using Palestinian and Arab architectural styles. And that was, you know, Hebrew University was built, if I'm not mistaken, 30 years before the state of Israel. It was the precursor to the, it was supposed to manifest Israel before the state of Israel. And so by putting these, you know, um, you know, architectural, you know, using these architectural styles, what it was meant to do was indigenize, you know, a settler colonial project, right? So for the long-term future, I mean, I'm more concerned about the long-term Palestinian future with, 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 with Palestinian cultural artifacts being appropriated. But for the long-term Israeli um, identity has worked quite well because it allows you to talk about hummus and falafel and you know, Israeli food as, it's, as it being from the ground, from that place, right? And that's sort of the biggest, you know, um, that's part of this str Palestinian struggle against, you know, Israeli settler colonial rule. Um, yeah, so with regards to Ismail, you, you know, um, I don't know what your question is, but I will say that this sort of, you know, um, idea of Palestine and Palestinian nation, even putting in this in quotes, is very much part of the settler colonial Zionist narrative, right? Um, one, as I mentioned, um, with regards to my field work in, uh, in you know, Israeli museums where the term Palestine never appears. Um, but it's also um, in terms of, um, you know, in my more recent work where I look at, who have done ethnographic work in Israeli settlements and how they talk about Palestinian villages and communities in the vicinity, you know, this idea of, you know, Palestine also pops up there where they say, you know, when I ask them about their relationship, when I ask them about their relationship with, you know, the nearby Palestinian village and they'll say, well, you know, there are some, you know, Palestinians or Arabs or whatever you want to call them. I mean, yeah, it's, a, you know, you can call them a village, but I don't think it's even a village, it's just a group of people, right? 
So this idea of you know, Palestine being Palestine and the Palestinian nation being a Palestinian nation is very much part of that narrative that serves to unsettle the 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 and the anti the Palestinian anti-colonial struggle, saying that we don't really have a claim to a to Palestinian land or Palestinian identity or Palestinian nationhood or Palestinian food because Palestine has never existed. Um, Finally, with regards to looking beyond, uh, no, then you had the question, Jana, you had the question about best talk about Islam when discussing decolonization beyond, you know, beyond looking there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe that was not well put, but I think that my whole idea of, you know, not dismissing Islam, but or not dismissing religion, but not talking about it, you know, as a thing in and of itself, you know, it's 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 primarily in one I recognize that you know scholars have done some great work on this already. Sarah Roy, uh, um, Jerome Gunning, who've done fantastic work on sort of the religious aspect of it. But what they've also shown that the manner in this which really this religious identity or this religious um, uh, activism um plays out is also contextualized you know is also informed by the settler colonial context and that's the context i really wanted to talk about um uh, it's not looking beyond it but it's also look but it's it's about looking at what else is at play that shapes that islamic organization as we want to call it right and religion is not uncommon to be mobilized in this way to, in a anti-colonial struggle in India, for instance, again, I go back to India, sorry about that, but, um, um, you know, um, Partha Chatterjee's book, you know, he talks about, you know, the, the uh, you know, he talks about culture, right, about Bengali culture, and how, and I'm putting it very simply as a much more complex point, but he talks about how the outside world being the world that is dominated by the colonizer, right? They have the colonized institutions, the police force, and the men who go out there to work there, they are sullied and, 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 and um, in, you know, almost they become impure by these effects of colonizer, of, of the colonizer's processes and institutions. Yet the homestead where religion and language are very important, where the women dominate, that's where the nation is really being built because those, you know, you know, facets of the indigenous identity really keep up their sense of self, whether it's language, whether it's religion, right? Um, with regards to will the, will the state building process of Palestine complete if occupation um, end? Um, I'm not sure if state building processes um, I'm not sure if that's, I'm not sure if the state building process will end just as the nation building process will not end either. Because as we've talked about, um, there are, you know, much, you know, beyond the institutions of the state, there are other processes, there are other um, aspects of Palestinian culture, economy, society, identity that are under attack and that are being, you know, appropriated under settler colonial rule. So I expect that as those processes will, will continue to, you know, somehow solidify the idea of what it means to be indigenous, um, that will have to reflect in the state as well. Right. And a lot of times I think liberation processes have been incomplete because we have argued that once we secure the state, well, then we are liberated and then, then we're done. And then we see a country like India and the transformation that have happened or the other things that have happening have, have been happening in India. Right. So I think that what Palestinian activists and, you know, have, you know, living in Palestine have very quickly demonstrated to the world. They've shown that liberation is beyond that, beyond that sort of state building process. And and I believe that that process will continue long, you know, after the um, occupation or settler colonial project ends.
Thank you, thank you, Sandeep. That was uh, great and absolutely uh, wonderful to have you with us and uh, in the hope that we'll have you in person, maybe to, uh, well, not maybe, certainly to uh, present your next book, which uh, we're very much looking forward to, to reading. It, uh, it sounds uh, very interesting in the way you, you described it. Uh, you'll find a couple more comments at the end, but we don't have time to address them, but they are not actually questions, they are just a comment. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Aki, for uh, organizing and supervising this for the Center for Palestine Studies and the SOAS Middle East Institute. And uh, thank you all for attending and all those who stayed with us, who are uh, some uh, 45 who, who stayed until the end. So thank you and uh, uh, very best wishes to, uh, to everyone. Thank you very much and thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Aki.